Okay, so this is this is it. Let's have how when we start with a minute of silence. That'll be good for the hashtag audience. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And for those of you for whom it is morning, I know some are people are in other parts of the world. Uh, this is an experiment to encapsulate a course that I taught at Berkeley for nigh on to 15 years. Good. Um, and it, interestingly, I started it as a freshman seminar. And let me tell you how I started this course. The chancellor introduced this program of freshman seminars. So it was uh, a way to get professors teaching for practically nothing, which he was always giving, you know, give you what you, something you want to do and then you don't have to pay us. And uh, we, we could teach this course on any subject. So uh, I had been meditating for some years and I, at one point I know we in the meditation center, the Blue Mountain Center, were trying to work out some kind of accommodation some kind of mutual understanding between us and the world of psychology, and it wasn't always a very good fit. But we found this one psychologist who really spoke to us, and that was Viktor Frankl, and he wrote this famous book. Original title was From Death Camp to Existentialism, and he later retitled that book Man's Search for Meaning, because the one thing he discovered in being put in a situation uh, we're absolutely deprived of meaning was uh, that if you had some sense of purpose in your life, you stood a much, much better chance of surviving that camp. And uh, if those of you who have read my book, a Happy Audience, will know that uh, in it I tell the story of uh, Maximilian Kolbe, who was a, a Polish... A uh, priest, a very popular priest, had a following of some 20,000 people. He was, had meet, you know, people in Japan, all over Europe. Uh, he was also arrested. The, the Germans were arresting Catholics at that point, and especially people in the Catholic hierarchy who weren't cooperating. And he uh, was in Auschwitz, and one day a man escaped, and uh, what they did was they lined everybody up in the camp. They brought them all out, had them stand all day long without giving them any food. They took out the, f the food that was des destined for the men and poured it down the drain in front of them. And they said, if he's not found by the end of the day, 10 of you are going down to the, the basement. The basement where they would just put you in this room with no food or water and you would die there. And it was considered to be like the worst thing that could happen to you at Auschwitz, which is saying a lot. And um, so this one person was chosen to be killed, and he, he started crying, my children, my wife, you know. And Kolbe was touched by this, and he did something extremely bold. He spoke excellent German. In fact, his last name is German, so they offered him the opportunity to be let out as someone who was Volksdeutsch, you know, ethnically German. But he refused, he went in with his people, and when he saw this man breaking down, he said to the, ca the commandant of the camp, a man named Fritsch, he said, I'd like to ask you a favor. Well, you, you know, asking me a favor, what do you want? He said, I'd like to die in the place of that man. And uh, they allowed him to do it, and he did die mm -hmm. some five days later. And uh, what was not obvious was that he probably saved the lives of something like four or 5,000 men by doing that. Because in Auschwitz, if you lost your will to live, y you were probably gone in about 10 or 12 days. And they were living there in this incredible uh, lie that human life is worthless, that human beings have no agency, and here is one person who just not meaning to, he broke through that lie. And he gave these thousands of men 
something to live for. And it's not like he planned it. He just wanted to help this, get this one person who did, in fact, live. He, he died at the age of 93 after acting in a rather poor film on, on the life of uh, Kolbe. You know, he saved his life, but he, he, he didn't turn out to be a good actor. Anyway, uh, this showed some sense of how important it is for a human being to have meaning in their life. And I know that uh, there's a, a story about a woman named Tenzin Palmo, a t woman who adopted Tibetan Buddhism. She was a woman from the UK. She uh, has become famous because she lived in a cave in the Himalayas for 12 years. And that book also is interesting read. But um, at one point she was back in the UK. So here's, you know, with her head shaved and her Tibetan robes. And she's on a train going to Wales and sitting next to her across the aisle with these two detectives. Fell into a conversation with them. They were going to Wales to arrest somebody. And so... They had this conversation, and one of them got very serious and just turned to her and said, can you help me find some meaning in my life? And, you know, here's somebody, is, his local purpose is very definite. He knows what he has to do. Go to Aberystwyth, find this person, arrest him, bring him back. And it's all very, very purposive in that very local sense. But the more he does these very purposive things, the more he's losing sense, losing a sense of the meaning of life. So I'll say, of course, we'll all say a lot more about uh, how important it is to have a sense of meaning very soon, but just to get back to my story, and those of you who've had a class from me, I guess nobody here has actually, so, yeah, yeah, of course, tall, so you know about these digressions. Like the whole course can be digressions. <laughs> the last week I quickly got back to the subject. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, so uh, we had read Frankel, and I had a colleague in San Diego who was a biologist who wrote a book on human nature, and she had uh, determined that the, you know, when I was to, went to school a rather long time ago, I was told that human beings have three needs, food, clothing, and shelter, and, and that was it. And I also, in my biology class, I was given to understand that I was a primate with flat fingernails. You know, this is what distinguished me from chimpanzees was apparently chimpanzees have curvy fingernails and we don't, so <laughs> that was it. But you better pass your exam, but basically you're a chimpanzee with flat fingernails. Um, but she got onto Maslow's hierarchy of uh, goods, I guess, and went on to make her own definition of what human beings need in order to live once they have food, clothing, and shelter. Of course, there's about a billion people on this planet right now who don't have that. But, okay, given that that's satisfied, like here for our community in this country, you also need three other things. You need uh, bonding, autonomy, and purpose. Bonding is basically the Ubuntu concept, you know, that you cannot be who you are in isolation. You, you, your life takes on its meaning only in connection with others. Who was, who was that researcher? Her name was Mary Clark, Mary E. Clark. She lives up in uh, Forest Grove, Oregon right now. I describe her as a recovering biologist. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, bonding is, of course, you know, social, this, our social reality, our social definition. Autonomy is our individual capacity to carry out what we feel to be, okay, what we want to carry out, or in better cases, what we feel is the meaning of our life. And purpose is, you know, a sense that our life uh, will not have been lived <coughs> in vain. And it turns out that these things are uh, not just luxuries that you can tie on. Let me uh, read you a quote that was collected by uh, Deepak Chopra. Um, a few years ago, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in Massachusetts published a study, which has since been replicated in France, 
in which scientists and statisticians looked once again at the risk factors for heart disease. They found that the number one predictor of fatal heart attacks, you know, we're not just talking hearts and flowers here, the number one predictor of fatal heart attacks, which had initially been described as job dissatisfaction, was more precisely pinned down as a lack of meaning or purpose in life. So you don't have to be an Auschwitz to need a sense of meaning in your life. I'm saying a sense of meaning because a little while we want to delve into what is the evidence that there actually is meaning. And the fact that we need to have a sense of meaning is some evidence but it'd be nice to have something a little, as Shakespeare would say, grounds more relative than this. So I looked around at these incoming freshmen, and I asked myself, what is the thing that they need most that they will never get at this university? And I stumbled upon a book by Anthony Cronman, which the title of the book is Education's End, Why Our Colleges and Universities Have Given Up on the Meaning of Life. So here you have something which you need in order to live. It's not a luxury. And the universities, which are designed to help people live in a fruitful and useful way, are not providing it. So I decided I would teach a course on the meaning of life. And uh, I know what I thought the meaning of life was. But if I went in and told the students what I thought the meaning of life was, Maybe one out of 15 would believe me, and anyway, the course would be over. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't get my princely salary of $2,000 or whatever they were giving me in research funds. So I, I did something which uh, I'm pretty good at now, but I was terrible at back then, which is to let other people talk. So I told them that what we're going to do here is I'm giving you permission to think about the meaning of life. It's not like I'm going to tell you. If I tell you what I think it is, that'll happen in the last week of the semester. And that is pretty much what happened. The last week they would come around and say, okay, so what do you think the meaning of life is? And it was a wonderful experiment. I taught it, as I say, for about 15 years, and it was maxed out every time. You know, you can only take 15 students. And I made an interesting discovery that as a freshman seminar, it didn't work very well. But the next year, they introduced a sophomore seminar. We could do the same thing for sophomores. And on a hunch, I thought to retool this as a sophomore seminar, it worked much, much better. Because I think freshmen, we were talking with these high school freshmen yesterday, and they said, your freshman year, you're so confused, <laughs> you're so distracted, you could hardly figure out what gender you are and what you're supposed to do with it. Mm -hmm. So by the sophomore year, you've settled down and you've begun to look around at the university and realize that it's not going to teach you what you deeply, deeply want to learn, need to learn. And as a sophomore seminar, it worked brilliantly, and I'm still in touch with some of the students who, who took that course. Zoe, you know, who am I going to make it Zoe? So uh, what I thought we would do today, I'll talk just a little bit more about the kind of the setup and framing some of the questions. Then I'd like to start off the way I did in the Berkeley course, which is uh, reading a poem by Yeats, an Irish airman foresees his death, which is, it's a wonderful poem. Every year that I taught it, I discovered something else going on in that poem that I hadn't realized. And guess what? Thinking about it yesterday, I said, oh my gosh. I've been reading this all these years, and I missed this one very important word. So someday we'll completely analyze this poem, and then I will retire and we'll stop teaching. <laughs> I will have I figured out the meaning of life. But we'll just kind of hand it around, I guess, and read a couple of lines a piece and comment on it. What is it saying about the meaning of life? And then uh, we'll get to the second poem later on, which is the, the poem by Jalaluddin Rumi. Um, and I guess that's about what I would like to say by way of introduction. So does anyone have any like questions or pointers, something that you came here hoping to find out? <laughs> we have this friend in San Diego, uh, another Stephanie, who's our education director, and she 
was looking for the course packet for this course, and she found it. So she sent me an email saying, I found the meaning of life. (laughs) 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 Then in the text it says, well, not really, but you know. (laughs) So any any comments? Because this is your chance to shape things. The only thing I don't want you to ask me at this point is, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> is that cartoon going around, by the way? Yeah. It's made mm-hmm. Yeah, for those of you who are watching the live stream, this is this traditional cartoon of the Westerner who's clambered all the way up on the Himalayas to consult with a guru. And he says to the guru, what is the meaning of life? And the guru says, I don't know, the computers are down. <laughs> Yeah. So that's right. Good talk. It'll show up in a couple of minutes. In a minute. Will the meaning will have changed by then? Yeah. Good. It's a little bit hard to see on the live stream. Okay. Well, you know, yeah, I did describe what it says, and we can also uh, make a better photograph of it and. If people want, we can send it to them, I guess. Yeah. So, any comments, questions, anything you. Yeah. Okay. And I get to do whatever I want. <laughs> you, you're going to do it anyway. So. Okay, you know. You, you know me by now, with Fatima. Yeah. I was working with a friend of mine, a poor guy who was an editor at Neil Geary Press, and He handed me back something, and he said, uh, well, uh, I'd I'd like you to do this, that, and the other thing, but, you know, do whatever you want. And then as he he turned and walked away, he muttered to himself, you will anyway. So I did not feel good about that. (laughs) Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't we read four lines apiece and just hand it around? So I have to tell you the background for this poem. It was uh, the background of the poem is World War I. The Irish were, of course, British, quote-unquote. They were fighting on the side of Great Britain. But they had just finished the, or actually in the middle of the war, there occurred something called the Easter Rebellion, where they rose up against the British, who was very, very bloody. Turns out that violent rebellions often don't work. Nonviolent ones often do but they didn't know that. And uh, so the, the dilemma that Yeats addresses in this poem is people risking their lives to fight for the British Empire, which uh, most of them were actually fighting to get rid of. Uh, and in fact, they, the, at one point, the Irish had actually invited the Germans in to Ireland to invade Britain from that. And I I think God didn't allow that because he wanted Gandhi to get rid of the British in his own way. But be that as it may, the poem is about this uh, dilemma. Okay. I won't attempt to read it in Yeats's accent. Okay, it's called, An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen, Kiltartan's poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. <clears throat> or leave them happier. Uh, nor law nor duty bade thee fight, nor public man nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed a waste of breath. A waste of breath, the years behind. In balance with this life, this death. 
Good. I tell you what, why don't I just sort of read it through because I'm on the microphone here and it'll give us a chance to sink in again. Okay. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. My country is Kiltartan Cross. My countrymen, Kiltartans poor. No likely end could bring them loss or leave them happier than before. Nor law, nor duty bade me fight, nor public men, nor cheering crowds. A lonely impulse of delight drove to this tumult in the clouds. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind, in balance with this life, this death. Okay. So this is... Uh, kind of a sonnet. There's kind of a sonnet form with rhyming, four line sets of rhymes and the, the punchline coming at the end, mm -hmm. the way sonnets do. What, uh, what's he talking about here? You might ask yourself, what is this poem doing in this class, <laughs> in, this, in this meeting? Tall. It seems that he's looking in meaning in war and violence. Yeah. He's actually, you know, through it, he's trying to see what is um, yeah. the meaning of life. Why do they live? Yeah, yeah. And um, when he writes about that the past was um, a waste of breath, and yeah. also the years to come a waste of breath, yeah. almost as, you know, when we talk about war and conflicts and yeah. violence, we said, you know, how can we make peace? Already, you know, so many people died for the past. Yeah. It's almost like disrespectful for them. Yeah. But then again, all the people that are going to die. Yeah. Um, you know, it's also a waste of life. Yeah. So where, where do we put an end yeah. you know, to the conflict? Yeah, that last point that you're referring to, Tal, uh, Kenneth Boulding, the peace researcher, mm -hmm. had a very good term for that. He called it the sacrifice trap. Mm -hmm. And once we've sacrificed a certain amount, for something, we, even if it turns out that the something is not desirable, we have a hard time giving up because you, we can't say, hey, I can't give up now, I've already invested, blah, blah. And I know I, it was very poignant for me because I heard my uncle say that. How can we get out of Vietnam? So many people have died already. Stephanie? Just a question, what is um, Kiltartan? Well, I think that Yates is just trying to give it local, local... Uh, concreteness there, that he's not not just you know Irish. He's from this little community, okay. yeah. And but do note that he he adds that his his countrymen are Kiltartans poor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I remember very poignantly when we started the war in Iraq. Mother Teresa uh, begged President Bush and all the others. Actually, it was pretty much him not to do this, and she said, I beg you in the name of the poor and all those who will be made poor by it. Yeah, we, we heard yesterday from a friend that we're working with that recently on television an American Air Force general was on CNN telling the people why we need this fantastic new fighter plane, which is so complicated it probably will never even get up get off the ground, and he said that the, th this plane is so sophisticated that the helmets that the pilots wear cost a million dollars a piece. And it was struck me because the budget for the nonviolent peace force for this year is a million dollars. One helmet of one fighter plane. So the incredible impoverishment that's being caused by this drive, you know, that, that Yates is talking about here. Okay, I would pay a million dollars for a helmet which, when you put it on, you didn't see any enemies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in fact, this helmet does the exact opposite. It lets you see enemies before they see you. That's the point. Now, in the middle of the poem, if I might just, you know, my parents paid a lot of money for me to get a PhD, so I figure every now and then I might as well use it. There's the rhetorical device in the middle of the poem is called a praetoridio, where you go buy all of these things that don't apply 
and you lead up to the one that does apply, and that's the climax. So note that he ticks off all the reasons for war and says that not one of them applied in his case. He's fighting for people that he hates against people that he doesn't. He knows he's going to hurt his own countrymen. Uh, politicians didn't get him to do it. Cheering crowds didn't get it to do it. Um, let's see. But what did get him to do it was a lonely impulse of delight. A lonely impulse of delight. I think that is like the key to the explanation here. And then he, he goes on to say that, as you, you were just saying, Tall, that's all he had to live for. You know, look at his past. He saw nothing that told him he should stay alive at all costs. Look at the future. He saw no hope. So th now wh how should we characterize what, what does he mean by that lonely impulse of delight? Th this is going to be where the poem is really, really relevant. Think about it psychologically. Think about times when you've taken a risk. Like, I remember a rainy day in the uh, Lower East Side of Manhattan, and I was on my motorcycle, which was not a very big, heavy, stable machine. It was 125cc Moto Guzzi. And I took a very sharp turn onto a street. As I say, it was raining, and it turned out the street was cobblestone. And I was like hanging over like this. And among other feelings, like stark terror and <laughs> things like that, there was a little thrill of, you know, woohoo, adrenaline rush, something like that. So when we start naming it like that, you know, here we were with these four high school kids yesterday. And basically what they told us was what they don't give us any meaning to our life, they deprive our desire to learn of all the joy, they bleach all the joy and enthusiasm out of it, and then they bust us for taking trucks. Now, you may or may not have seen it, but recently Chris Hedges, who's a very, very good journalist, he recently wrote a book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. And his article of that title is in the packet for this original course. So what you know, this Irish airman is typical of what we call today the poverty draft. You can take people who have very little to live for and give them something incredibly exciting to live for. A sense of power, a sense of camaraderie, and a sense of thrill that you are, as he says, balanced between life and death. You could die or kill at any moment, and that, you know, kind of recharges your endocrine system, and that gives you a feeling. And I'm going to guess that what's actually happening is it gives you a sudden, deeper sense of concentration. Because I know when we, when we take Fancy here out for a walk, she'll be trotting along with you on the path, and suddenly she'll go, <coughs> you know, go bolt upright and look across the field, and she smells a deer, you know, kill. And she falls into a very deep state of concentration at that moment, which is deeply rewarding. And if you can't get it in some more legitimate way, you're going to be forced to get it from ways that are destructive, not only to you, but to everybody else. And so th this is by way of emphasizing uh, how important it is, how crucial it is that we give people a meaning, a meaning in their life, not, not just as individuals, but as a culture. If you don't have meaning in the culture, you're going to look around for somebody to kill. You know, spend a million dollars per helmet, look for enemies, and that gives you a kind of pseudo meaning. And I think it was David Corton who pointed out that human beings cannot live without meaning. If you don't give them a real one, they'll find phony ones, pseudo-meanings. You know, it's like G.K. Chesterton was someone, he was a Catholic, and someone approached him and said, 
Isn't it terrible, GK, that people don't believe in God, they'll have nothing to believe in? And he said, my friend, it's much worse than that. If they don't believe in God, they'll believe in anything. And that's you know, a lot of what we're seeing. So, uh, <clears throat> just to uh, emphasize a little bit more on this, uh, the potency of a sense of meaning, there was a famous experiment that came to be known, and those of you who are in public health will be aware of this, came to be known as begonias are good, budgies are better, beagles are best. Because what they did was they went into a uh, convalescent home and they gave every patient in the home a potted plant, you know, a begonia, and they told half of the patients, I'm sorry we don't have enough staff to take care of this plant. If you don't water it, it'll die. The other half, they said, oh, you're sick. You know, don't worry about this plant. We'll take care of it for you. Thank you, thank you. Now, the people who were told that they had to take care of the plant got better quicker in a statistically observable degree. So they tried the experiment again with something a little bit closer to us on the uh, hierarchy. If you believe in evolution, this would be you know, further up the chain. And they, so they put in little uh, you know, birds, you know, little budgies. And then they, it was even more significant. And finally, they gave him a puppy. You can imagine you're lying there in bed. You hardly feed yourself. You've got to take care of this puppy. And it had just was miraculous effect. So this tells us not only that having a meaning, something to do, something to live for, is what Norman Cousins would call a therapeutic reality, but um, so it says two things, I guess, that, that, that meaning is important and how that, what that meaning has to start looking like. And it, 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 you have to, it has to be a sense of service to life. Uh, other things, you know, in, in, in going through this course for so many years, I began to notice that people are collecting lots of quotes about the meaning of life. They collected quotes and they were able to do a final project on absolutely anything that they wanted. And one of the project that sticks in my mind the most was one woman came in and, and did a batch of cookies, uh, which was much appreciated by the rest of the class. But it turned out that the cookies were allegorical. You know, you need some sugar to sweeten up life, and you need some dough to, you know, she, she had allegorized all the ingredients for cookies. Anyway, uh, so I got to look really at hundreds of quotes of people saying this is the meaning of life, and they seemed to fall into two categories. One category, people were saying, you know, the person who, ends, who dies with the most toys wins. And then you try to have more plus days and less minus days. You know, if, if you've read Catch-22, which was a very stunning novel back in my day, um, there's a character in it who, you know, every day he says, was this a feather in my cap or a black eye for me? So very, you know, and then if you have more feathers in your cap and fewer black eyes, that's the meaning of life. And I call this a kind of default. You know, in other words, you're trying to enjoy the moment, knowing full well that there's a limit to how many moments there's going to be. The other group which is much more interesting. A lot of them were embedded in religion. In fact, if you were to Google, because it shows you how on up to speed I am, the 21st century, if you Google purpose of life, the first three things that come up are religious groups. You know, come here, we'll show you the purpose of life. You know, get back to Jesus. <laughs> and, um, but alongside of that group, and even within that group, it was, it's all about surface. Let me read you a quote from Gandhi at last. I can't believe we've gone all this time already and I haven't read Gandhi yet. Uh, and you'll find this in the book, The Way to God, on page 38. For, you know, we have copies of that book here. Gandhi said, Man's ultimate purpose, man or woman, man's ultimate purpose is the realization of God. And all of his activities, social, political, religious, have to be guided by the ultimate aim of the vision of God. 
the immediate service of human beings becomes a necessary part of the endeavor. Simply because the only way to find God is to see him in his creation and to be one with it. This can only be done through one's country. <laughs> yeah, I thought the last part is interesting. The last line, this can only be done through one's country. What do you think he meant by that? I'll give you a hint. It starts with an S. <laughs> the Swadeshi. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Swadeshi. Let me put that up here. I don't know if folks are going to be able to read this, but Siva means one's own, and uh, Desha means country, and so Svadeshi is having to do with one's country, dealing, starting with one's own country, and uh, Basically, the way he interpreted that is you start with the smallest circle and go let that expand from there. Um, so he started his work in India, actually, when he came back. He started his work in... Uh, there's a couple of people walking around outside. Is that our people? <laughs> of course, there are people. Everybody is our people. I know that. <laughs> uh, so he actually started in his home state of Gujarat with people who spoke his language of Gujarati and basically expanded from there to the whole world. So that's why he throws in that last part. And that's something to keep in mind because I know when I was teaching the course, we, we kind of realized that there are two questions here. Does life have a meaning and does my life have a meaning? Because if life has a meaning but I have no way to relate to it, that's not going to do me any good. Oh, it does me a little bit of good, just a little better than thinking that life is uh, meaningless, which is kind of drag. But I guess you don't use that word anymore. But um, part of the question is, how do I articulate my meaning with the larger meaning of life? And Gandhi's clue for that was Svadeshi. Start with the smallest circle that you are in. Do the best you can in that circle, and then things will expand and radiate out from there. And I noticed, incidentally, uh, we have this marvelous project called Roadmap, as you all know, at the Meta Center. And we're recommending that people work on personal empowerment and then do constructive program with their own community and then confront the machine. And so it's like a perfect Svadeshi, and I didn't even realize that until I was having a talk with Kazu. A couple of weeks ago. Okay, but aside from the Swadeshi point, uh, it's interesting that he gives it the name God. He's perfectly comfortable with God language. Not all of us are. But whatever people start with, God language or something else, they almost always come back to this question of surface. In fact, even Fancy, who is outside right now, the, the dog who's adopted us. We looked up her breed so, you know, we could take care of her while she was here. And we were told that she's a Katahula and Katahulas need a job. <laughs> so if she needs a job, how much more, you know, do we need a job? Okay. So let me pause at this point. You have, do you all have any comments? Yeah, Tal? But I actually think that Although he uses the word God, yeah. it's very practical because he doesn't say serve all, serve God, but serving God, yeah. serving his people. Yeah. This is the practical work outside of this, not outside, yeah. but together with the spiritual work. So it's not yeah. only spirituality. If you only do the spiritual practice, yeah. then you are not really maybe serving God because you are mm. serving God through serving the people, which is yeah. very practical work. Yeah. You need to do very physical yeah, and he allows you, even if you're not comfortable with God language, he allows you to get something very meaningful out of this, to serve your fellow human beings. And there's so many studies now that have shown that uh, 
it's immensely therapeutic to be of service to others and to feel that your life has no value to others is uh you know it, it's it's a health danger even yeah yes robin my life and the community, my community. Mm-hmm. Like right now, there are like 70 to 80,000 refugees who are resettled in the U.S. and currently the, our community has the highest rate of suicide in yeah. the U.S. From, yeah. So when I was in refugee camp, we, we did have the same situation. Or, I mean, youths were in armed force and then robbery and then things and then the suicide rate was the same thing yeah and being here like we came here hoping that we'll find new meaning to our life and yeah. a better future yeah but like when when we came here like we had cultural shock and yeah language barrier and then like we cannot relate with the people here and the culture here. and then we just feel like the meaning of life is like yeah. Not for us. Mm. Yeah. Just really Yeah. You know, hearing you say that, Robin, reminds me of an episode that I just read about that in the terrible riots that took place at the point, time of partition between the Hindu and Muslim communities. There were these attacks on Hindus by Muslims in, uh, in Bihar, and uh, Gandhi went up there, and he couldn't be everywhere he sent his niece to go to one of these communities and she collected all the Hindus whose homes had been burned and so forth and collected them in a refugee camp and proceeded to get in uh, donations of food and blankets and give them to the people who needed them. And finally, uh, Gandhi came on a visit and she thought that he would be very pleased with what she was doing. Well, he wasn't. He, you know, he wasn't displeased. He didn't say you're fired, but he said, "I do not want these people to be collected in refugee camps. They must go back to their communities and mingle with Muslims." And he said, "This shocked her even more. Don't give them handouts." And she said, "What? You know, they're coming to me starving. They everything's been destroyed. They have nothing. They're going to starve to death." He said, "I need you." to put a stone wall around your heart. And don't give them food, give them work. Whatever it is, let them work for their food. Even if, you know, you don't need to measure it out you know, per rupee, per ounce, but they have to do something to give them back their dignity because, as he said, they have lost everything and now you're taking away their dignity also. So, right, this is supposed to be the great melting pot and everybody's supposed to fit in here, but the fact is, if you haven't watched CNN for 30 years, you're not going to fit in very well to this country. And uh, maybe we can spend some time talking about that problem in particular. Yeah, I know that uh, Pat and Jill will be interested in talking with you because immigration is their thing. Yeah. Stephanie? if you could talk, if everyone, we could talk more about this idea of pseudo-meaning and what it has yeah. to do with violence and non-violence. Yeah. Okay. Maya? Yeah, so on that note, when we read the poem, Yeats' poem, and, and the first part of the conversation after, mm -hmm. uh, what comes to mind for me is this gang shootings. Yeah. You know, the, uh, yeah. Can yeah. More. yeah. It's so, such a vivid image. Yeah. If we only understood what was going on here and we only understood what human beings are about, we would read this gang phenomenon as a tremendous warning signal that you have not given us something to live for. Uh, I was just reading about uh, the, the failure of the drug war. You know, and hundreds and millions of dollars worth of cocaine coming up here from Venezuela. And they always ask themselves, why has it failed? 
Well, it fails because they're looking for very downstream solutions. You know, wait till people get addicted and then try to intercept the drugs when it's, you know, halfway between Honduras and Los Angeles. Um, instead of asking ourselves, why are these wealthy, uh, what's the term we always use, privileged white people taking these d dangerous, dangerous drugs? And, you know, my, my son-in-law is a doctor, you know, my son-in-law the doctor. <laughs> and so I hear from him all the time about these patients that he's seeing. Like minimum of one third of his patients do not have to, do, never should have become patients. They became patients because of substance abuse. And now as the substances get more and more, I don't know, potent or something, the damage to the physical system gets more and more. So you have people coming in using crystal meth and their teeth are gone, their hearing is gone. So like that's really, really killer stuff. And that's why I thought a course on the meaning of life, you know, would really get to the root of this problem because it it's so clear, as Yates points out, when you haven't got a real one, you're likely to go for a pseudo one and your criterion is going to be what gives you the biggest thrill. And if you are blind and deaf to the deep satisfaction that comes from helping your fellow human beings, then that thrill is going to be whatever is most uh, physically charging. Yeah. So with like the idea of m meaning and pseudo meaning. Yeah. If someone says, you know, the meaning, I'm going to try to get like, deeper in this, but like the meaning of my life is my child. Mm -hmm. That child mm -hmm. is everything to me. Yep. And then that something happens to that child. Yep. And that then could throw that person into yep. a state. So, what, what, what are you? Terrific. To, you want to go on that a little bit? Yeah. I don't know if everybody can hear what Stephanie is saying out there in the live streaming world, but. Uh, said, what if you have a person whose all their meaning is centered in their child, and I knew such a person in Berkeley, um, and that child is gone? Sometimes, for example, they grow up, and then you have this empty nest syndrome. Uh, then what? And that, that's terrific. That gives us a new, a new category. A new category, this is not a pseudo meaning. This is a partial meaning. If you could come to understand that the amount, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take off on this. <laughs> if you, for example, other people, this is going to be very parallel, other people do not feel that their life is meaning until they, meaningful until they have a one-on-one -on -one romantic relationship. Now that, okay, let's think for a minute about St. Augustine. This is a little bit dangerous because... I start thinking about St. Augustine. He tends to occupy the whole rest of the conversation. But um, he had this episode when he was a teenager. He had this friend, and they were very, very close buddies, like two of the kids who were at our studio yesterday. And, you know, with teenage boys, the love that you can share is like a romantic relationship. And suddenly his friend died. And he was grief-stricken. He went into an existential crisis, and he's looking at the rest of his life, and he's saying, okay, I don't want to suffer like this anymore. So it looks like I have two choices, either not love anybody like that, or go around being vulnerable all the time. Mm -hmm. And he finally figured out that what he had to do was allow that love to expand. So that his, what, he came up with a wonderful formula, Beatus qui amat te, et amicum in te, et inimicum propter te. Now, depending what kind of high school you went to, you probably need me to translate that. <laughs> he, he said, blessed is the person who loves you. He's talking to God. Blessed is the person who loves you and loves his friend in you and loves his enemy for you, for your sake. So that he could have that same intense concentrated love that he had for his buddy 
who we never named, so we don't know who the person's kid's name was, but have it for everyone. And here's where Gandhi comes in and says, yes, you can love everyone, but you got to go by Swadeshi. Don't go from your boyfriend to the world. You know, your boyfriend, his family, my family, and on out there to the rest of the world. And Ishran talks about this young man at Stanford who came to him and said, I had illumination last week. And Ishran said, that's fantastic. Well, he didn't say that. He never uses that word. He said, that's wonderful. Have you told your parents? He said, oh, I'm not speaking with them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very, very good what you said, Stephanie, because this gives us a clue. If we want to find meaning in our life, what that is saying is, we already have found the, tr the path to that meaning. Yeah. And in fact, there's a, a verse in the Bhagavad Gita which can be translated as, it doesn't actually say that, but this is a, a secondary meaning. It says, you can follow the path of happiness to eternal bliss. But it has to be the right kind of happiness. You know, It's not the kind that you get from Drugs, for example. You know, Jill, you wanted to ask something a long time ago. I got, I got emotional. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you know, I was, um, when often people, and I have been there, uh, yeah. find the meaning of life through religion. Uh -huh. and some, and, but, but often, religion can lead to you know, not expanded love for people, but yep. for... I'm right, I yeah. do right, and you do not. <laughs> yep. You know. And then it's worse than just thinking you have the right of wrong opinion. This is life or death. Right. It's worse than life or death even, you know, eternal damnation. This wonderful cartoon in The New Yorker of this fellow standing in front of the pearly gates, and the, the person who lets you in has a, is, kind of looks like a judge, you know, who's a wig, and, and he's closing the book. And he says, that's it. I don't want to talk about it. You chose the wrong religion. That's all there is to it. <laughs> <laughs> so notice, hang one second, Sammy. So notice how quickly Gandhi does that segue from you have to realize God to service of people. And in fact, service of their ultimate welfare, he will go on to say later. And Abdul Ghaffar Khan said the same thing. He said, I, I, the only meaning in my life is to serve God but he doesn't need my service. So this is a big dilemma, but my fellow humans need it a lot. So that's, that's what I'll be doing for him. Yeah. Oh, I was just reminded of that story of the, these two religious men sitting next to one another mm -hmm. <laughs> and at a party, and um, one of them turns to the other and says, you know, we're the, we're the same. We, you know, we're both men of God. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then one man who's a fanatic looks at him and says, yes, we're both men of God, and you worship God in your way, and I worship God in God's way. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was Gandhi. That was Gandhi? Yeah, it was Gandhi, and a, a British uh, prelate met him at a party and said, we're both men of God, Mr. Gandhi, aren't we? And he said, yes, you are. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's a different story. Yeah. Different story. Erase that part. Go back. Yeah. <laughs> no, what Gandhi said was, uh, uh, I am a man of God disguised as a politician, and you are a politician disguised as a man of God. <laughs> so being nonviolent doesn't mean being Mr. Nice Guy, the nice guy all the time. Yeah. But is there a way as well? I mean, this is what's interesting, is that if we're, if, can, can there be meaning without... I think there can be. Can I just say, I don't think in that case it's, you know, you know, what I was saying is just that it's, as Patty says, your God is too small. You know, people have very small gods. <laughs> yeah, Patty? So, yeah, one sec. So interesting. I actually have never heard this word before. I am new to this, but um, I think the reason me and Jill bond it was because we say the same thing, but we use different language. Mm -hmm. and, and what my experience is, and you can take the word God out, it's like, mm -hmm. It, it, it is like the if I'm coming from a Catholic background with the whole doctrine of the incarnation. It's mm -hmm. like, well, but we take it too small, right? We mm -hmm. don't see that God is 
you know, you can think of the incarnation as God's everywhere, God's in everybody. Uh-huh. Everything is a part of that, and it's that connection that gets you there, which yeah. which the only way you can know God is yeah. through what you're living right now. Mm-hmm. That's the only way he's, mm-hmm. there, he's, he's around. And so then when you start talking about this, I start going, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Is that you can't get there, you can't get to that sense yeah. of connectedness until you get to it in yourself, and it yeah. comes out, and you see the connectedness to the tree, the grass, you know, the person right mm-hmm. next to you, regardless of the situation. Yeah. And I, I think this, your life kind of teaches you that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Patty, I'd like to say two things about that and then finally get around to you, Cecilia. Um, there's a Greek writer, uh, <coughs> Xenophon, who is basically not terribly smart. He's uh, distinguished among other Greek authors who have survived by being not brilliant. Uh, But he did say one incredibly good thing, which is uh, that he could see, or he had faith, that we have been given enough to go on, that the gods have given us enough to go on. And, And I think of Bertrand Russell saying, God, you didn't give us enough evidence. You know, he's given us enough evidence. It's true that we're in a very obscure situation, like... Where is it, and and how do we find it? But we do have enough to go on. And I think uh, there's an English mystic by the name of William Law who said in a passage that I've actually used as a meditation passage, God is everywhere present, but he is only present to you in the deepest recess of your soul. So... It's like God is present everywhere, but if I go out and commune with the chickens, you know, because I'm annoyed at them because they make leaves and dirt all over our path and we don't even eat eggs. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it's true that God is anywhere. And theoretically, I could realize God in anything, even in an inanimate object. But that is like hopelessly difficult. Whereas to realize God in my own soul is not hopelessly difficult. It's fiendishly difficult. And, you know, that's difficult enough. But So it's like we have to know these two things, that it is possible to have this realization of my small self melting away in the whole and be completely satisfied, fulfilled forever, and also that there is, a, there is a sense of how we can start, where our journey starts. And, you know, as you were saying, it starts wherever you are, because wherever we are, there we are. Sorry, I didn't want to mean to be corny there, but, you know, we carry our soul around with us. Yeah. So, Chilia? Yeah? So, what's coming up for me is my practice. And, uh-huh. um, and right now, it's interesting that we talk about the meaning of life and and looking for that meaning externally. Yeah. Um, you know, we we can go to the moon and we can go conquer other countries, but mm-hmm. when it comes to just sitting with our own mind mm-hmm. and making realizations within our own mind, yeah. we tend that's I guess the hardest thing to do. Yep. It's easier to fix kind of what's out there rather yep. than what's right here. Yeah. And what was coming up for me was the practice that I'm doing that was um, put forth by Pema Sambhava um, is this idea that um, who brought Buddhism uh, to uh, Tibet from India Mm -hmm. Um, he says that we spend our lives looking maybe externally Mm -hmm. for meaning but what we're truly seeking is is inside ourselves Mm -hmm all along Uh and that's kind of like the big journey it's like we're always looking for what we can't see but we can feel what we Mm -hmm. know is there Mm -hmm. waiting to be discovered Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was what was coming up for me Uh it's a a good observation and then the other thing that I thought was interesting um, about this um, when you were talking about 
this lonely impulse, of mm-hmm. this yeah. adrenaline seeking. Yeah. And I th- and you were talking about how men, you know, the, this Yeats poem and and how they they go to war to seek that. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, my, you know, I had that experience with childbirth. Yeah. That experience of being very aware and alert and in the moment and having to be awake and getting that rush of adrenaline within mm-hmm. my own body mm-hmm. and then feeling that moment of bliss when all mm-hmm. of those love hormones kick in and mm-hmm. you see your child mm-hmm. and you have that bonding mm-hmm. um, and that's that transcendent moment mm-hmm. that, that I had and that mm-hmm. a lot of women can yeah. have if yeah. it's not co-opted by the yeah. medical industry <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah and so I it's, just think it's so yeah. I feel I, I felt grateful for being able to be a woman mm. and, and have had that experience yeah but i recognize there are lots of ways to have that experience, yeah not just each other. yeah well i i shall never have that experience but uh what what's in not in this <laughs> lifetime <laughs> right i've had it thousands of times <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of that fellow who comes to his teacher and says, oh, I may not make it in this life. I just have wasted my life. And he said, you've wasted so many lives. <laughs> sure. In fact, it's, uh, it's noon, actually. <laughs> Does that suggest anything? Hmm?